Hello, I'm Kay Lemon, Executive Director at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, since 1961, nonprofit MSI has been the bridge between marketing theory and business practice. We fund research by leading academics worldwide on topics voted on by our 50 plus corporate sponsors, and we disseminate the results through webinars like these, many members only events, and a variety of publications. I'm really pleased to welcome you to another MSI for members by members webinar. This is a series of webinars on subjects related to our current research priority topics. First, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have for Paul during the presentation. We'll then gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. Also, Paul's slides as well as the entire webinar will be available for download on the MSI website. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Paul Argenti of the Tuck School of Business has kindly agreed to present today's webinar on defining, nurturing, protecting, and measuring reputation. Uh, professor Paul Argenti is currently professor at Dartmouth Tuck School of Business. Prior to Tuck, he also taught at the Harvard Business School and the Columbia Business School. He currently serves as faculty director for Tuck's Leadership and Strategic Impact Program and Tuck's Executive Programs for several global clients. He has two books that have just recently um, been completed. One is his seventh edition of Corporate Communication, uh, came out through McGraw-Hill. And he's also just completed a new book entitled Corporate Responsibility, which focuses on corporate values, shared value, corporate character, and the purpose of the corporation in modern society. Uh, you can also find Paul blogging regularly for HBR, The Washington Post, um, and appearing on NPR. And uh, he'll tell you later how you can uh, potentially follow him and get in touch with him. So let's welcome Paul. Thank you, Kay, and welcome everybody. I'm delighted that you're joining me today. I thought I'd spend just a minute more talking about what I do and how I got interested in reputation before we get started with the presentation. So um, I actually studied marketing uh, in business school and have a background also in communications um, through my interest in English. And, um, and the two together became a fascination with the topic of corporate communication, which has been the area that I've spent most of my time researching. About, I would say, 15 years ago, I started to get interested in reputation with a group of other academics. And the academics who make up the field of reputation come from management, marketing, and communications. And together, we formed a group that uh, has met several years in a row that talks about these topics. My interest in reputation flows naturally from the study of communication, and I think you'll see a lot of those influences in what I talk about today. What I wanted to talk to you about today was how you can think about reputation and define it, how to nurture reputation, protect, and then some new insights in how to measure reputation that I've been working on. Uh, and the last part is, is very, very new material, a little bit more theoretical than the rest, but I'm hoping to try to be able to talk to you about that in a very simple way. Let me start by um, using this quote from Socrates. I went to a high school called Classical High School, studied Latin and Greek, and I, I love this quote. It stuck with me throughout my life. And Socrates said, to gain a good reputation, endeavor to be what you desire to appear. It's really very simple if you want to think about how you can best um, maximize your potential for a, a great reputation. Just do the right things. Don't get into trouble. Uh, and try to be who you say you are. And that seems to be easier said than done, as we can see from the problems that companies get into every day. I have zero problem finding material for op-ed pieces, blog posts, and Twitter, my Twitter feed every single day. It's amazing how difficult it is for companies um, to gain a good reputation by endeavoring to be what they desire to appear. It's kind of sad, in fact, when I think about it. So what I wanted to do with you today was to start by talking a little bit about the environment for business and some of the negativity that surrounds us as we try to think about our reputation and how it gets distributed to people, how it gets managed. And I think that context is important for you to understand before we even get into the next topic of defining reputation. 
And I spent a lot of time trying to think about how to talk about reputation um, and how to make people understand what reputation is over the last 15 years. And I hope that the simple explanation that I'll give you today will be adequate enough for us to have a conversation. So that, that's the second part of it. And then the last piece, I'm going to talk a little bit about measurement. I think, um, I think the way people focus on measurement is probably not the best way. And what I want to do is try to give you a way that I think will be uh, richer for you. Whether you focus on the measurement tool that I'm talking about or something else really doesn't matter as long as you think about it in a, maybe perhaps a different way than you focused on it before. So let me start with the uncertain uh, environment for business. I actually started getting interested in this very early on in my career as a result of some research that uh, has been published over the years in terms of the responsibility of business. And as Kay said, I just recently published a textbook on the topic of corporate responsibility, which is one of the subjects that I teach here at the Tuck School. Back in 1970, this is a U.S. poll about um, you know, the question of responsibility. And the way that this question is typically asked, and the way I say typically is because it's been asked in a variety of ways by a variety of people, but it's typically asked, does business balance profit and the public interest? Which it's kind of a measure of um, how you see business in terms of the way they uh, value society and what kind of a shared value they have with society. Back in 1968, that number was 70 percent. Um, by the time we get to 1985, it's 30 percent. In 2011, it's 10 percent. Who knows what it is today, but I'm, not, I'm guessing it hasn't gone up in the last few years. Business hasn't done anything to make people feel more confident about them. I, this is a devastating poll when I look at it. And I, I just want to explain a couple of things about this so that you understand what is going on here. The first thing is, you know, how could people possibly believe that business was more responsible in 1968 than they are today? If you just think about it, I, I'll give you categories to think about. Were they more responsible in the way they treat women? No. Were they more responsible in the way they treat the environment? Absolutely not. Were they more responsible in the way they uh, trans transparently distribute information? I, I can't think of any topic where business was better, quote unquote, in terms of their responsibility uh, in 1968 than they are today. And yet, as business has become more responsible, in my view, people's perceptions of business have continued to decline. And when I ask people in executive education programs or in speeches why that's true, most people usually jump to the conclusion right away that it's because we know more about business and that's true, or that there's more coverage of business in the media, and that's absolutely true. But one of the key reasons um, that we focus on the responsibility of business, and this also has to do with reputation in a profound way ultimately, is that if you look at when the numbers started to drop in the 1980s, it's exactly around the time when Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher started to talk about business as the answer to many of society's ills, that business and the free market could be responsible for what's going on in a way that um, government really couldn't. And what came along with that, and I think this is unfortunate for businesses, was a sense that uh, you need to be more responsible than you were before. We have more information about you and we don't like what we're seeing. So. If you just look at what this means, that means that 90% of people start off by thinking, yeah, you don't do a very good job of really working on what's best for society versus what's best for you. So your reputation is shaped to begin with by this. I also believe that businesses don't do a lot to enhance their reputation by what they present to the world. I, I love this slide as a, a great example. I know there are a lot of marketing people here. This is an advertisement that I used with an energy client that I worked with uh, to try to give them an example of the kinds of ways they presented themselves in the world um, in the past and how you probably didn't do a very good job either in marketing or communications of presenting yourself in a way that would lead to a great reputation. This of course is the ultimate horrifying example. Corporations you know, that were in this space thought that this was perfectly fine to say every day humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. I have advertisements from Union Carbide that talk about um, how they were excited about um, building a new India and that, that advertisement basically 
uh, had a tagline on it that says a hand and things to come. And you know, of course they had Bhopal there. I have advertisements from mobile that show them pouring oil down a beautiful stream. Anyway, corporations don't do a very good job of presenting themselves, and I think this is a metaphor for that. When we look at the global landscape, I think this um, this study, which uh, came out from Accenture at uh, Davos a few years ago, and it hasn't changed much uh, when it's come out again. It's pretty much the same. It's kind of the over-under on trust. And again, trust is very much related to reputation. I've written about that uh, in a couple of different places. But when you look at who the most trusted institutions are, the military comes out number one in almost every poll that I track. And Global companies and large national companies tend to come out on the bottom. People always ask me about government, and again, I don't do these polls myself, so this was a poll that didn't include that, but I guess government would be probably somewhere close to the bottom in the United States, and it kind of depends on where you look. But look at what's number two, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that often are the antagonist to business. And I think you understand that there are um, several problems here for businesses as they try to present themselves and to create the kind of company that would lead to a strong reputation. So that's, that's a major problem. I also think it's interesting when we look at trust, how people perceive business people, executives specifically. And what we've seen is that since the uh, market collapse in 2007-2008, there's been a direct extension to the collapse of confidence in business and government. I think it's interesting, and I'm sure, Kay, you will appreciate this and the other academics on the phone, that the most trusted spokespeople are academics, which I'm very excited about that for us, but it doesn't do much for business people. But the more interesting part of that trusted profile is that peers are the most trusted spokespeople. And if you just think about it, when you want information, if you're going to New York for the weekend and you want to know where you're going to eat, you're probably not going to look at the advertisements in the back of the playbill to determine where you're going to go. You're going to look at Yelp or whatever, um, TripAdvisor or Zagat, and look at peer recommendations. So peers have become way more important. And the least trusted spokespeople today are corporate executives and government officials. We then couple that with this notion that people need to hear or see something three to five times from multiple sources to believe it. And you understand that what is happening is people get a lot of their information about companies online from peer-to-peer -peer information. Companies basically either present advertisements or participate in media in a way that is not as trusted. And as a result, uh, the three to five is probably coming from those peers and not from corporations. One last uh, part uh, in terms of polls that I think is interesting from this year's trust barometer is the sector analysis. And, um, and you can see that it's interesting as I look at this because if we go back to when these polls were first done back in the 1980s and uh, the most admired companies would probably be the best tracker of that from Fortune, pharmaceutical companies were the most trusted. And of course, that's changed dramatically with a result of direct-to-consumer advertising. And you can see that technology companies are starting to drop as we have questions about what they're doing with our data and um, their hiring practices and all the stuff that I'm sure all of you have read about. So I think it's really interesting that trust in institutions, trust in people, all of these things determine to some extent how likely you are to have a strong reputation. So if you're, for instance, in a bank, financial institution, and you're an executive, um, you know, your reputation starts at a place you probably wouldn't be very excited about in a race to start with, and I think that's unfortunate. There is one other part of uh, business that upsets people, and that is income inequality. Uh, and the ratio executive pay to worker pay is often one of those attributes that we look at that people say is why people have such a dim view of business and why their reputation is so weak. If we go back to the 1980s, 42 to 1, 1998, this is CEO pay to janitor pay, if you will, um, 419 to 1 in 1998. By 2000, it's 531 to 1. It's always somewhere between 250 and 400, depending upon how they measure it. And again, most people just say, you know, I don't understand why we have to put up with this. Why do we care about what people make? So the reason I wanted to share this information with you before we get into reputation is to show you that the ground is not fertile 
for developing a strong reputation to begin with. And this is globally. The only countries where this would not be true are countries with you know, despotic regimes where business is a little bit more highly regarded, and oddly enough, communist countries, particularly China, Vietnam, these countries' business has a much stronger profile and starts from a, a stronger base. So uh, in most of the, the most powerful capitalist nations, most people have a dim view of business before we even get started with trying to think about our reputation. As someone who teaches management and communication within that field, um, when I think about reputation, it really has to start with who you are. And the biggest problem that most companies have is that they can't say who they are. They can't even say what their strategy is if they try. Um, and I often meet with senior executive teams, and we'll start with this as a concept and say, you know, unless you have a strong strategy that is communicated to people, it's very hard for people to form any clear picture of who you are and to think about you in terms of reputation. And I get stopped a lot by um, the head of HR or senior executives like the CEO at one meeting that I had who said, stop, that's fine here, we all get it. But when I asked them to actually write it down, there is no commonality in what those, the answers to these questions are. A couple of weeks ago, Lucy Calloway wrote an article on values in the FT about this, how she had a group of 40 executives in a room and had gone to their websites of the companies of the people who were there and wrote down what the values were. And she blurted them out and asked them to vote on which ones were theirs. And these were senior executives. And I think um, something like 50 or 60 percent of them couldn't identify any of the values or identified the wrong values, even worse. So unless there's a clear understanding of what the company is, you're starting in the hole in terms of what you can actually do to influence people to understand what your reputation is. This is the communication strategy framework that most people who have followed my research over the years would know me for. And the most important part of this from your perspective is twofold, that we have to think about communication from the perspective of the audience or what I call constituencies, and that going into that communication, our reputation influences how well people will take our message. So for marketing people, if the company has a weak reputation and you're putting an advertisement out there, you know, the ability for people to consume that in a way that is going to be positive is probably not very high. If you're a spokesperson for a company that is under fire, say Volkswagen right now, your reputation is not the strongest, it's going to be difficult for people to believe you. That's, that's the simple explanation for this that I wanted to point out. So let me try to define for you uh, for a moment what I mean when I talk about this concept of, um, of reputation. And I'm going to try to do it in stages uh, for you. And, and the way I think about it that's the easiest for people to understand is that the only thing you can really um, influence is corporate character. And that is who you are. I, we could call that corporate identity, but I think that gets people mixed up and start thinking about architecture. What I'm really talking about here is that who you really are, that which is central, distinctive, and enduring about a company, the things that you create, the things that you say, the way you describe yourself, your brands, all of that would be part of the, the things that you can actually influence in terms of developing a strong reputation. From there, we have image. And your image is a reflection of the organization's identity or its character from the vantage point of one constituency. So your employees have a view of you, your customers have a view of you, your suppliers have a view of you, and those are individual images. Your reputation is a set of collective images, how all constituencies view the organization over time. So this framework is a useful way, I think, for people to uh, think about this, that you create character through the things that you uh, talk about in terms of yourself, your names, your brands, your symbols, your self-presentations. And I think it's safe to say in my view, and I know that not everyone will agree with me on this, and I, I've gotten into very exciting conversations with my friend and colleague um, Kevin Keller about this, but in our brand and reputation program that we teach together, I say you create a brand and you earn a reputation. You, you've created the brand in the first place. Now, other people will add to that, and it's a more complex situation than that. But, but, but if we just think about that, you can call your product whatever you want. You can symbolize it in any way that you want. 
but reputation is something that you don't create. You don't manage. You earn it. And it, it, maybe it's better to say that it's an aggregate of the perceptions of the different people you interact with and notice that they interact with each other. So that's one way to think about reputation is just to think of it as sort of the distillation of all of the different constituencies' views of you. Why is it important and what makes a good reputation? Well, in the research that I've done and uh, some of the research that uh, Edelman has done as well, what we find is that the top factors in building a reputation include communicating frequently and honestly. And this is a problem for a lot of companies. They just don't like communicating frequently. Producing high quality goods and services, a pretty obvious one. Treating employees well. I actually did a study for the National Consumers Union and asked them, um, you know, what do consumers value most in terms of responsibility of businesses? And their answer was how well you treat your employees. That's from a consumer point of view, and I think that's really interesting. Committing resources to the greater public good or maybe some, some level of greenness would come in there. And then in a crisis, which is often when your reputation is kind of on the line, to admit your mistakes, face your critics head on, and clarify the reality or how the future is going to be different from what our expectation is. Now, what we know from our research over a long period of time is that if you have a strong reputation, you can charge more, and I think that's intuitive. You pay less to suppliers. You get the best people to work for you. You have stable revenue. Um, you have a competitive advantage in that you don't get into tr trouble as much as other companies might. And you get a lot of loyalty, both internally and externally, which gives you greater latitude to operate and to have that license to operate in society. And the stability part of it I think is important as well, that companies that are highly reputed have higher market valuation and stock price and less volatility. So the price advantage, the competitive advantage, the stability would all make you wonder, why doesn't everyone want to focus on reputation? Well, the simple answer to that is that they, A, have no idea what reputation really is. B, they have no idea how to measure it even if they did know what it was. And that in general, I think most executives, most managers look at reputation as they do all intangible assets. It's something that, you know, I know it's important, but I don't know really what to do with it. And I certainly couldn't even imagine that I could measure it. That's kind of where reputation sits for a lot of companies. One of the things that I want you to kind of hold in your mind as I go through this discussion today is that your reputation is the most valuable asset that you have. I mean, the only proxy that we have for this in some sense is the inner brand um, you know, ranking that focuses on the value of brands. How they do that and whether that's right or wrong is something that is highly disputed, I'm sure. But if we just think about those numbers that, say for Coca-Cola, it's in the $80 billion range, and the assets for Coca-Cola probably in the range of 6 to $10 billion, we realize that just for brand, um, that intangible asset is worth anything that you have. So your reputation, which is a bigger category, has to be worth more than anything else. As a result, we try to think about that in terms of reputational capital, that you have a pot of capital and you're either putting into that account, if you will, if you want to think about it in terms of like a bank account, your reputation account, or you're taking away, depending upon the things that you do. So one of the ways to think about this is that your reputational capital needs to be protected. So at the very least, you should have a safety net in place to try to make sure that you don't um, affect your performance, typically financial performance as we think about it. But you also today find companies, and I think the best companies in the world, focusing on the opportunities that come along with protecting that reputational capital. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment in terms of uh, risk. But I want to give you two examples. Uh, my first one is Coca-Cola. Most people um, uh, know that Coca-Cola is obviously a very highly regarded brand, that a lot of people drink Coca-Cola. But it takes a lot of water to make Coca-Cola. Uh, the, the numbers that it takes vary depending upon who you ask. But more than one can of Coke to make, more, more than one can of water to make one can of Coke, probably more like four. Who knows how many? But as you think about that, the product has a problem, if you will, and there's a risk to the overall reputation of the brand and the, the company. And as a result, you want to try to think about how to mitigate that risk. And what Coca-Cola did was team up with the World Wildlife Fund, and if you were paying attention before, uh, NGOs are the most highly regarded institutions in terms of trust. So with a highly trusted institution organization, um, 
and basically said, we're going to give back all the water we take out, and in a sense, to become water neutral, which is remarkable. So before you even know there's a problem, Coca-Cola company is putting it right back at you. Similar, and I wrote about this in Harvard Business Review, CVS decided to stop selling tobacco in its stores. And I think this is a really interesting um, thing that they did because really it didn't make any sense for a pharmacy to be selling um, tobacco uh, and in the first place other than to make money uh, unless you think that people would get sick and you know get cancer and have to take the, the pharmaceutical products that they sell. But it just didn't make any sense for this company because they're trying to transform themselves into a health company. And the CEO, as he says here, we came to the decision that providing health care and selling cigarettes don't go together. And this is what I would call that opportunity platform. Before you have to do something, you figure out what you're doing that you shouldn't be doing and you stop doing it. And that's where the notion of risk comes in, reputational risk, which is the gains of possible, the, the uh, range of possible gains and losses in that reputational capital for a firm. Now the risk is made more difficult because as this definition from the Commercial Bank Examination Manual, which I know you all like to curl up with on a, a rainy day like today, but in the Commercial Bank Examination Manual, the definition is the potential that negative publicity, whether true or not. So it doesn't even have to be true what someone says about you or what people say about you to affect your reputation. Um, it can lead to all kinds of problems. Product offerings affect risk. Um, uh, outsourcing affects risk, and you need to manage, in my view, the reputational risk in the same way that you manage operational and financial risk. So one of the ways to think about what you can do as a result of what I just talked about, and I know this is a, a, a lot of practitioners on the phone, one of the things that I advise clients to do is the following. You should be meeting regularly with senior management teams and asking them two questions. What are we doing that we shouldn't be doing? And what aren't we doing that we should be doing? Because that in itself would mitigate a lot of the risk associated with um, what can harm your reputation. And I think it's a very, very important to understand that. So this last piece I want to talk about is measuring reputation. And you know, unfortunately, it's the 21st century. A lot of companies still measure reputation this way. And I put up a, you know, a really old cover just to show you that they're using something that is a, a very much a 20th century tool. I have no problem with the most admired list. I think it's an interesting glimpse at corporations. But if you think that's a proxy for what your reputation is, you're absolutely wrong. The, the other thing I would say, however, as someone who teaches in a business school, which is probably the most ranked industry in the entire universe, is that polls affect your reputation. So you know, just in the last month, we've been ranked three two, and 14, the same school by the way, and each one of those has an effect on other polls and on our overall reputation. There's no question about that. But the reason I bring this up is that if you rely on things like the inner brand ranking of your brand or the RQ from the Reputation Institute or from Fortune's Most Admired Alone, if you only look at these snapshots, you're, first of all, you're getting a very public kind of look at your reputation rather than a local look at your reputation, what it actually is. And you're really not using, I think, the, the advantage of what we have at our disposal today in terms of data to measure your reputation. One of the things that I would say is that given that reputation is critical to every decision a corporation makes and that it has value in terms of outcomes, understanding the potential value gives you a competitive advantage. So you have to try to think about ways to measure that. And the knowledge of the potential value and specific messages that you're sending out can also drive your communication and marketing strategy. I think it's really exciting to imagine a world in the not too distant future when you will be able to understand which variables um, are the ones that you need to focus on to meet the, uh, the optimum in terms of your brand or your reputation. And I think at the reputational level, it's even more exciting than it is at the brand level because it affects your company in incredibly different ways. What this relies upon, however, on your part is to start measuring each of the dis different constituencies and getting feedback from them in a way that is rich enough for tools to measure what is going on. 
and then to try to think about some, you know, some way of, of focusing on that that makes sense. I'm going to give you a way that I've been working on recently that I think might be intriguing to you. It's a relatively new model. Um, we are just starting to use it uh, with companies. Um, and to think about how this works in the future to me is so exciting that I wanted to share it with you today. And it's an evolutionary model for explaining brand and reputation. And the way this model came up, and there's a little post uh, on my website about this and the way that this came about, but a colleague of mine in the biology department, uh, his daughter and my son are friends, and we met that way and started to talk about what we do. And as we started to talk about what we do, we realized that we do very, very different things. He and his wife study evolutionary biology, and I study reputation and communication issues. But that by putting these two things together, maybe there was something that could come out of that. Two years later, um, I have a much better understanding of what he does, and he has a much better understanding of what I do. Let me try to explain it to you. He and his wife, who are both evolutionary biologists, measure natural selection in terms of the traits of individuals, like that lioness on the left, across a population and in competitive environments that increase the chances of survival and reproduction. And when I heard that, I said, God, that's just what companies do. Right? We want to measure different traits or variables across a population in competitive environments that will increase your chance of success. And whether how we measure that is an interesting question. These same tools can be used to measure traits for animals. Uh, uh, it would be you know, aggression or speed in the case of that lioness. And in our case, it would be brand and reputation for companies in a competitive marketplace to increase the chances of success by maximizing something that we've come to call brand fitness, which are the attributes in uh, um, uh, an area or a, a company space that make up the best attributes to explain what's most successful with your brand. So the way biologists do this to predict how a population will evolve is by using what they call this adaptive landscape. This is a relatively new approach to measurement for them. But this adaptive landscape maps different strategies like trait combinations. So to go back to the lioness, it would be speed and aggression for survival and reproduction to find high fitness peaks like where, where are they best, where those attributes add up together to create high fitness and the kinds of animals that will survive, you know, bird beaks versus birds with small beaks, and then low fitness, so you're, you're lower on the totem pole. Now, the evolutionary uh, adaptive landscape model can then predict how selection on these traits moves the population to these high fitness peaks. And you can't see the arrows moving because of the uh, limitations of the technology we're using today. But those arrows, you should be able to move up from one peak to another and have progress towards the local or global trait that increases your chance of survival. Well, to me, that was exactly what we're trying to do uh, in the research that I do. And, and a company A wants to understand the health and drivers of its brand, and they want to quantitatively predict how to strengthen the brand with an outcome-based approach. Um, so the tools of evolutionary analysis can help. They can help us predict how to change the brand with an outcomes-based approach. They can assess changes in fitness through time and across demographics. Why did it change? Is it better or worse? How do we focus on the traits that matter? And go beyond simple linear attributes of brand measurement. Um, you know, if you really look at the way uh, companies measure these things, and particularly when we get to reputation, it's much, much worse than uh, what marketers do in terms of brand, I find. Um, you need to know what aspects of brand or reputation fitness affect each other. And you need to be able to optimize your investments to get that right. So I'm going to show you very quickly a couple of ways that we do that. One way is we replace evolutionary fitness with, say in this case, given that we have a lot of marketing people here at Corporate Brand. And we use mathematical models that are adapted from the study of evolution, facial recognition, human geno genome analysis, and through that, uh, the corporate adaptive landscape predicts how you can strengthen your brand or reputation. So that's part of what we do. Um, so you may want to know, how did my fitness change last year over time? You have to have a lot of years of data to do this, we're finding. But you can identify how a company's brand changes over time. That's one of the things that you can do. You can also see how it changes from one environment to the next uh, versus your competitors. And look at the traits that matter in different environments. 
So uh, what I would say here is that um, measures today that we're developing can provide quantitative measurement, the amount to invest to achieve maximum fitness, in other words, the attributes that lead to the best um, and most successful brand, to identify traits that drive changes, and also to show what factors are the most important to determine fitness in different competitive environments like countries. So let me end uh, my part of the presentation by saying the following. You operate in an uncertain and highly negative environment in most parts of the world. Reputation is an outcome based on inputs from multiple constituencies who know that they have a negative view for the most part of business. And then finally, most measures of reputation are flawed. Companies need an outcome-based approach to measurement to really understand what their reputation is all about. And for the most part, they use linear and simple models based on social science to try to understand what those things are. And I don't think that gives you the picture that you really need going forward. Fortunately, over the next few years, I think many people are working to try to enrich that and make it easier for us to understand what your reputation actually is so that you can influence it. I'm going to end with this quote from Warren Buffett. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. And maybe one of the things that you'll do is try to figure out what your reputation actually is versus what someone else says it is. And then to try to figure out how you can influence that so that you can be the best that you can possibly be. Thanks very much. Kay, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Thanks, Paul. That was, that was great. Um, we have a few questions that have come in already and, um, and some others that uh, I want to kind of talk with you about in a minute, but I want to remind people to send questions directly through the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, I want to start off because, you know, as, as you know, I've kind of looked at the customer side and trying to measure key drivers and outcomes. Um, two questions that come kind of thinking about this um, evolutionary model, which I think is very cool. So the first is, um, and then they're related, so I'll ask them both and let, then let you answer. Uh, what types of outcomes are you looking at or measuring? You know, if you think about the brand fitness, right? What would yep. be some specific things that would be um, exactly what you would measure? And then recognizing the people are on this journey at all different spots along the journey and uh, looking at the, the awesomeness but perhaps complexity of the mathematical model, yep. uh, what would you recommend a firm or an organization do as initial steps to kind of trying to assess and measure this reputation and perhaps begin to identify one or two or three of those key drivers that would move them along toward uh, brand or reputation fitness? Great, great, great question. Uh, let, let me um, talk to you about the outcomes that we can measure. I, I mean, one of the outcomes is, uh, some of the outcomes that we look at would be the kinds of things that you would um, need to influence to enhance your brand or reputation. So if you think about the, the four key constituencies that I had up there before when I was looking at um, and maybe I can go back. I, I, it might be easier for me to just go back and put this up. If you just look at um, this for a moment, and I'm trying to think about my reputation with multiple constituencies, one of the outcomes would be I try to understand which place I should spend more time worrying about. And, and the great thing about the complexity, Kay, is that the former linear approaches to this were static so that you didn't know how much employee do I need to focus on versus customer to get the right fitness. You know what I mean? So it's the same thing, like how much exercise is too much? And we use that term fitness purposely. Uh, and how little should I eat to try to be as fit as I possibly can be as a human being? One thing affects the other. And so what we can talk about in terms of outcome is, you know, you should be investing just about this much in customers, so it's usually standard deviations from the mean. 
uh, versus the companies that are at the top of the pool in terms of fitness. That's one thing. The other thing that ultimately we can talk about is, you know, what is what is the potential effect on things like um, revenue, you know, the, the, the financial pieces. Um, that's more complicated, requires more data to do, but, um, and I think is actually ultimately less interesting for the brand, much more interesting in terms of reputation. In terms of what companies can do, uh, given that I think these kinds of models will become fairly commonplace in the next decade uh, because we have access to big data, and we have the ability to collect the data, is to start collecting data, collecting it regularly, and try to think about um, collecting information in a way that makes sense for you. That's all you really need to do. One of the things that we have found in the research that we've done, and we've worked with three or four different organizations at this point, including people who collect data and a couple of companies, is that companies collect a lot of data that they don't need to be looking at. So one of the things that you'll find ultimately is you can pare that down to a handful of, of um, data that you need to focus on. But just start collecting data, collecting it regularly, and don't stop. Because one of the biggest problems that we have is that companies will get into this for a year or two, they get excited about it, and then they stop and don't collect anything. It's very hard to make any calculations of particularly around reputation if you know, you haven't looked at your employee engagement survey for five years, and you collected an NPS score, say, you know, from your customers five years ago, but not recently. Um, so th those are a couple of answers to your questions. I hope that helps. That's, that's great. Now, while we're on this slide, um, one of the questions that came up that I think you have answered already is, what's the difference between the brand and the reputation? And I think this slide really gets to that. But Diving deeper under that, I was thinking that as you're talking about these investments, you've got the corporate character and you've got the or, the, or the kind of brand, right? And you've got the corporate reputation and in the middle you have perception of these different constituencies or stakeholders. Yep. And I was trying to ask, the, the, the question that came up was, where do actions fit in? So, mm -hmm. How right. you advertise, what new products you offer, uh, whether your CEO tweets when he shouldn't. Um, yep, you know, yep. wh where's the? I don't see that. I don't see like the what. I see that stuff happens, and then people have perceptions. Got it. So what do you do? Got it. So the only thing you have control over is this stuff. You create a brand. In other words, you've decided to call your product something and to put a symbol on it and to make presentations about it that might be advertising. This is the place where you have control. You do not have control over then how your customers perceive that. They may find it terrible. You know, you do testing and it seems like it's good, but they ultimately look at it and they respond back to you and say, you know, I don't agree with that. I don't, it doesn't make sense. Or they don't buy your product. You see what I mean? So the only place you have control is here. The only thing you can do is to try to affect the reality and to present yourself. Self-presentations are really advertisements would be falling into that category. This box, the Im this is the image here, right? So yeah. this box is, um, is the, you know, I've put the word image on every one to try to show you that you, you look at the world from the perspective of one audience when you look at customer, for instance. But reputation is the collective um, images. And this, this probably shouldn't be some. It probably should be aggregate. And you, you know, this is an evolving slide for me. It's in my book, and I've, I've actually published this before. But I, I probably think of that more now as an aggregate. But the only place you have control is here. Oh, you great. can decide what to call your brands. Now, uh, the difference between brand and reputation is that you create a brand, including a corporate brand, and you earn a reputation. You cannot manage your reputation. You can manage the inputs, not the outcome. Perfect. So here's a question. I'm going to read it directly um, off the slide so that I don't mess it up. Um, uh, in interpersonal psychology, trusting other people is seen as being the result of having repeatedly experienced the other person to be acting on your behalf um, to their own apparent detriment. How would that fit in or agree or disagree with some of the modeling that you've done? Uh, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting. I've actually thought a lot about this in terms of what is the difference between an individual and, and you know, a lot of this is 
you know, similar to the kind of things we think about in psychology for an individual versus the way we study reputation for organizations. So it is true that um, it's built up over time. And one of the flaws, and I'll be completely honest, and I hope there are other academics who get excited about this and want to spend more time on it, this doesn't include anything about time in it. And it should. And I've never really been able to figure out how that actually works here. But I do think time plays a role. Um, and one of the things we know, for instance, a, a lot of the, the studies of reputation, early ones like say in the 90s, um, looked at what happens to stock price after something like Exxon Valdez. And of course the stock price goes down, but you know, it goes right back up again six months later. What does that really tell us in terms of what's going on over time? We do employee engagement surveys and they don't like you and then you make some changes and then they like you. So it's a little bit different in terms of how corporations can influence this versus an individual. Uh, but what is similar is that when I see you trying to do things um, to change my perceptions, I'm skeptical. It's so interesting. I was doing a class with a group of executives yesterday, um, and I was showing them that Coca-Cola ad. And they said, don't you think they're really trying to sell me on this and that it's more of a communication thing? And so even the trust level as corporations try to do the right thing, and I really believe Coca-Cola, uh, like many companies, and Unilever is probably the best example in the world, are trying to create that sense of shared value with society. And in doing so, they're still not trusted because of what I talked about in the first part of the presentation. So I, I think there are some similarities here. Um, but it's not a complete one-to-one -one in terms of how we look at individuals versus corporations. Great. And another question that came up that I think is particularly interesting uh, has to do with um, uh, kind of thinking about this reputation model as it applies to uh, not-for-profits. And yeah. you, know, you, you, you mentioned early on that the trust in NGOs is kind of on the positive side versus companies. Yeah. But um, you know, how would you evaluate the reputational value of a not-for-profit? Uh, and do you see any differences kind of in the things that you've talked about today for a nonprofit um, versus uh, a for-profit entity? I really don't. I think the, uh, the things that change are, we wouldn't use the word corporate character, we'd use the organization, you know, we'd probably call it organization character identity. We have a different set of constituencies. You don't have investors as such. Maybe you have supporters or sponsors. Yeah, or donors. Or or, right. Yeah, but and it's the same. It's just it kind of changed some of the terminology. I've actually done that kind of work with, um, you know, with not-for-profit organizations, um, and and you know, a range too, like hospitals and and large complex NGOs that operate in the global environment. And it works exactly the same. Um, you know, and I, I thought we were mostly today would have more of a corporate audience, but often I will change those terms and put organizational character, organizational reputation. I think it works just as well. You know. And do you see the, uh, you know, we, um, you, you talked early on about uncertainty. Do you see the risks to reputation for uh, not-for-profit organizations as dis like just as the kind of types of risks as distinct from the types of risks that uh, your typical global corporation faces? Or are they similar? So you know here um, the reputational risk management cycle that I talked about before, I think that similarly they you know I've written about um, NGOs in, in, uh, in my research and in terms of their collaboration with corporations. Um, and I wrote one article in California Management Review that I think might be relevant here. And one of the things that I found is that you know, if the NGO collaborates with a corporation, it puts its own reputation at risk. You know what I mean? Right. So they have to be a little bit careful. So one of the things they may try to do is figure out, you know, how, do I have a, how do I think about the risk to my reputation in terms of the collaboration I have with, uh, with a um, with a corporation, or how do I think about the threats that might come as a result of funding problems? But they ought to be doing the same thing. What am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? What am I? What aren't I doing that I should be doing that might affect my performance? And you know, to say we shouldn't be selling tobacco in our pharmacies when the laws are changing anyway, especially you know California, I think is already there. 
why would I continue to do that and wait until the government tells me to do it? You know what I mean? So it would be the same yeah. for an NGO. If I, if I am not getting adequately funded or I'm having a problem in terms of, um, you know, like the, the Clinton Foundation in terms of the election, and that might affect the image of the organization, or regulatory environment in India and how drugs get distributed affected their reputation um, for the AIDS drugs. Um, you know, I try to think about those exact same things, to be honest. I don't, I don't think there's much of a difference here. What, what would be different is to go back to your first question in terms of outcomes when we actually measure the reputation of an organization like that. We're not looking at revenue and, you know, stock price. We're looking at um, probably, you know, whether people believe them or would be willing to collaborate with them. It would be more like an NPS score, you know. Yeah, or maybe changes in some kind of societal well-being, depending on the nature of it, the – Actually, right. Uh, that's right. That's right. right. Yeah, depending yeah. upon what they do. I was thinking of uh, different kinds of organizations, but right. that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, so the, the, the next question is, is kind of, again, um, I apologize for these double-barreled ones, but the good news is it allows you to kind of go whatever direction you wanted. Okay, good. Early, early on in your talk, we had someone who asked a question about whether um, – uh, reduction in worker longevity may have uh, influenced some of those changes we saw in corporate reputation. And I thought that was interesting kind of as more of a, a cultural trend or a global trend. Mm -hmm. And I wanted yeah. to combine it with um, just this notion of the huge innovations and changes in technology, right? So another yeah. huge shift I see, right, that's kind of a comparable shift in a sense to the change in worker longevity is just the way we use technology and the way we can share and, you know, yell back at a corporation and all these new innovations. And I was intrigued by your slide of the reduction in the trust in technology. And so um, how do you see some of these what we might call more seismic shifts in the way things are done in the world, uh, whether it be reduction in worker longevity or, you know, everybody has a smartphone uh -huh. as, as really influencing uh, reputation. You know, I think about simple things I study in marketing like a person who now can take a picture of a bug in, a bug in their salad on an airplane and just, you know, post it everywhere, right? So yeah, we're absolutely. at this risk of we control so much less. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I, I saw that question come up, I think, around this slide, am I right, um, yes, or initially? Yes. And, and you, know, I, I, you know, if we were sitting and brainstorming, that would be an answer that, yeah, it makes some sense. You know, we used to have a contract with people, give them a job for life almost, and have a long-term relationship and see employees as assets. And then we started looking at them as liabilities to be moved in and off the balance sheet, which is, you know, that's certainly one of the things. So that's the answer to that question. In terms of technology, I think that fits in with the notion um, that I was talking about in terms of, um, you know, how we look at peers and um, social media and how that's influenced things. It does make a huge difference. You know, okay, I was doing a, a, a fireside chat the other night in my executive program talking about social media. I wrote a book called Digital Strategies a few years ago, and people still want to hear about social media and things like that. And this guy was telling me a story that fit in with my own story. I, you know, I, and he said, you know, he was, um, he was on his way here to talk. He was from, coming from Saudi Arabia and he was at the airport and he was on JetBlue, you know, coming. He had flown, I, I don't know what city he had flown to, but then he was on JetBlue trying to get here. And um, they wouldn't tell him any information. So he tweeted to, directly to JetBlue and, and started complaining. And they told him exactly what was going on. Right. And I thought, well, if that isn't a great example of how, you know, the company is willing to use one channel, but the, the channel right where the people are, they're not willing to use. It's absolutely crazy. I had the same ex ex uh, experience last summer in that, you know, I had bought some tickets for a concert that my wife and I were going to go to. I couldn't go on that date, and I tried to go back to the company and ask them to change the tickets to another day. And I found out that my assistant had bought VIP tickets that were not refundable, which made no sense to me. I, sp I spent more, and I could get less, right? So I tweeted directly to the company and copied the CEO, and within 15 minutes I had a refund. Wow. Now, 
Yeah. What does that mean in terms of how your reputation is formed and the ways you need to think about managing your approach to customers? And actually, the way I constructed the message was based on my daughter who is a blogger. Um, uh, and she monitors for a company you know, their, rep their um, customers to see what people are saying. And I used all the buzzwords and boom, it triggered off an alarm bell immediately. Well, today what that means is that if I'm trying to figure out how to influence different constituencies to create a strong reputation, I need to be consistent. I need to be trying to get this part of the equation that I was talking about right in terms of thinking about how do I speak with one voice here? Often the, the, you know, the part of the corporation that is involved in the development of character isn't just marketing people or just communications people. It's, um, you know, it's lots of different players are involved in this, right? And if you're not speaking in one voice to all these constituencies, it has a huge effect. And to go back to my original slide that I used right at the very beginning on, um, on reputation which had to do with um, can you say what your strategy is? Most companies can't even tell people who they are the same way, given that the senior executives don't even understand it. And that has a huge effect, I think, on the overall effect that we have in the marketplace. So you need to get your story straight, and you need to get it straight. You can't be saying one thing to your customers and something else to your investors. I mean, even legally you can't do that. But it's an inadvertent mistake that companies make by not having uh, a joint effort and acting as one. So, well, that, that's great. Well, we are we are just about out of time. Um, this has been really fascinating. I have learned a lot. Um, I Thank think you. the folks attending learned a lot. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Um, I loved it. Yeah. We uh, uh, Paul has uh, said that. Uh, please follow him on Twitter at Paul Argenti. And um, I see we have one follow-up question that uh, we, didn't, we didn't get to that um, I will, Paul, ask you offline and we'll try and get back to the person who asked it. You got uh, it. Our, next, our next webinar, will, so please stick around for a moment. Will do. Our next webinar will be held on November 18th with Bill Pink of Millward Brown Analytics. We look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, many thanks to the members of the MSI audience and others who joined us today for participating in our webinar series. Thanks.